Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Everybody here really okay? Okay. Um, I'm going to be talking today about that topic. I'm going to focus mostly on the population numbers, and then at the end, I'll, I'll kind of try to talk a little bit about how it's going to affect the economic so well, taxes spending in the economy. But um, uh, the basic point is that um, Vermont's demographics are changing very rapidly, very dramatically, and um, very differently than the United States as a whole. So we all like to think that Vermont is different in many positive ways, and some people may think this is a positive way, but, but Vermont over the next uh, decade and a half or so um, is going to change in, in a very different way, and um, it's going to have some interesting features. Some are, again, some are positive, some are negative. So I want to start with um, just the population history of Vermont, because I think if you understand where we are and where we're going, it's really helpful to understand the past. That's probably why I was going to change what I was going to do. Right now. But what you see is, um, you know, Vermont's population today is a little, a little over 600,000, about 625,000. Um, but the interesting thing is that for most of Vermont's history, our population essentially didn't change. It was about 100 years where the population grew a little bit, but not much. And the U.S. was growing very rapidly at this time. Um, what happened in the 1800s was, it's not that Vermont women didn't have babies, and lots of them, just like women all over the country. It's just that when those babies grew up, they left. Okay. Why would you want to farm on a rocky hillside in cold Vermont and there's a hide out there? <laughs> That's essentially the story. But eventually, essentially, there's 100 years of, of just very stable population in the state. And then 40 years that all of us remember, because we lived through it, where our population was growing and fairly dramatically. Um, and so when most people think about population in Vermont, they think of, well, what's the big deal? Because our population's been growing, and, and some people think that's good, and there's a number of people in Vermont, including people who have kind of some of the thought leaders of the state, and the people that write letters to the editor, who think that one of the worst things in the world is population growth. It's destroying the planet. And the best thing we can do is have fewer people except for themselves. Um, but anyway, so, so there's really two different periods, and you can see the transition occurs in basically in the 1960s. So that, that 1960 number right there, um, that's the population in 1960 from the census, and it's up a little bit from 1950, but the big increase is in the 1960s, right? The 1970 census, 1980. And things grow very, population grows very, very dramatically. And again, uh, the key thing is that most people, people in Vermont, they've lived through those last 40 or 50 years. Um, there's very few people who remember Vermont in the 1950s or 1940s or earlier. So if we compare Vermont to the U.S., this is now just a growth rate per year. You can see. In those eight, the 1800s, that period where we didn't grow much at all, uh, the U.S. population was growing five, six times faster than Vermont. So, in the, between 1830 and 1840, Vermont's population grew at 0.2 percent per year, almost nothing. The U.S. population is growing at almost three percent per year. That's almost ten times faster. And you can see the difference in the height of those bars is just astounding for that whole period of time. I won't say a rough calculation that if Vermont had grown as fast as the U.S. every year since 1790, Vermont's population would be something like 8 or 9 million instead of 625,000. That shows up for that. And then you can see what happens in the last 40 years, beginning with the 1970 census, which is basically the growth rate of population between 60 and 70. And all of a sudden, in the 1960s, Vermont's population growth was the same as the U.S., and it was the same as the U.S. in the 1970s and the 1980s. The 1990s, well, the U.S. is growing a little bit faster, but, but still, we're, we're exhibiting pretty healthy growth. You have to go way, way back in order to get a growth rate that fast in Vermont. And then in the 2000s, that is between 2000 and 2010, um, the U.S. population is growing at about 1% per year. Vermont's population is growing at about 0.3%. So we're now where the U.S. is growing three times faster than Vermont, instead of over the past 40 years where we've been equal. And then if you look at the last five years, I didn't put 
2016 here, but we wouldn't change things. We knew that data for 16. Um, the reason there's no green bar there is because it's hard to show a bar when there's zero. So Vermont's population today essentially is the same as it was when we did the 2010 census. Now, the census is an actual count. The, uh, the number that we have for, for today is an estimate, but it's been pretty close. So the U.S. population is growing a little less than 1% per year. We're growing at zero. So how many times bigger is 0.7% than zero? Uh, infinite. Um, in the math people out there. Essentially, what's happening is that we just stopped growing. If you look at the recent past, you can see that between 2000 and 2010, and those are the numbers we really know, the only two estimates, Vermont's population was growing slowly and it kept growing more and more slowly. By, that, by 2010, it pretty much stopped growing, and you can see that there's essentially nothing that's happened since the 2010 census. Okay. So it stopped growing. And, and that increase from 2000 to 2010, uh, only about 15,000 people, is, is still a real small number. So essentially, we've got a stagnant population, and that is the key story for Vermont's demographic future. And it turns out to be uh, important for our economic future, and that's what I'm going to be focusing on. Okay. So why does a population change? And there's three reasons. The first one is just what demographers call the natural rate of increase. More people are born than die, you get a population. And in Vermont, we have more people being born every year. The most recent year we had data for 2016, about 6,000 births. We have more births than deaths, there's about 5,500 births. So some of our, our population change, I mean, the stagnant, but we are getting a net boost because we have more births than deaths. If you look at the difference between the two, you can see that in 2001, there were almost 1,500 more births than deaths. Now there's only 500, and if you kind of mentally draw a line, uh, there's a downward sloping line there, right? So it looks like the number of deaths and births are changing, and in fact what's happening is the number of deaths are increasing, and they will continue to increase, simply because we're getting older, the boom generation, those people born from 1946 to 64 are aging, and so there's just going to be more people dying each year. Births, I'm going to talk about that in a minute, but there's going to be fewer births in Vermont in the future, so at some point, that yellow line, and that point is not too distant in the future. I think it's going to happen probably within the next five years. That yellow line will get down here to zero. That is the number of births and deaths will be equal. And if we look at it by county in Vermont, I've had a lot of county, but I'm in Franklin County. Um, so um, if you look at the last 16 years, um, First of all, what you see is you know, Franklin County is positive. There's more births than deaths in Franklin County. Chittenden County is the leader. Now remember, this isn't adjusted for population. It's not a percent. It's just a number. But the crucial thing here, is, a couple of crucial things. Number one is there's really only two counties where there's more births than deaths. Look at the number three, Lamoille County. That's a pretty small number. And if you look at the rest of them, it's, just, it's negative. Right. So most of the counties in Vermont are already experiencing more people dying than being born each year. And as I said, that's going to happen to those counties up at the top as well. So we're already there in terms of the natural increase in population not occurring or being negative in much of the state. Not much of the state by population, but much of the state in terms of geography by counties. Um, so if we look at births, just the raw number of births, uh, a couple of interesting things about that. And I'm becoming more and more fascinated with demographics. I started talking about these kinds of things about 15 years ago, and you know we were listening to me, and I thought I was crazy. People listen to me. We're actually people become more interested. There's a couple of things. Number one, we have some data, and I have no idea how we have this or why, but in 1857 there was a report from some state entity in Vermont. And there were 6,500 babies born in Vermont in 1857. Probably none of you remember that. <laughs> um, notice that's more than were born in Vermont last year, two years ago, when our population was a lot lower. So the other thing 
that you can see. Now, this, this axis is not the scale, so you've got to be careful about that. But what you can see is um, 1940, just before the baby boom, there's maybe 66 or 6,700 babies being born. And then 1946 or 1950 is the next number I have here. By 1950, which is just into the beginning of the baby boom, there's almost 9,000 babies born in the mind. And that continues. 1964 is the end of it, of the baby boom. So, but you can see all of those baby boom births, right? Um, and that was essentially caused by um, more births per woman. Right? Um, there had been a secular down decrease in the number of births the average woman in the United States and Vermont had beginning in the late 1800s all the way to the 1940s. And then that is the average number of births per woman. And then in, in the baby boom, we had an increase in the average number of births the average woman had. Uh, there's all sorts of reasons for that, or hypotheses for the why. And that continued for about almost two decades. And so the other thing you see here is a big decrease uh, after the baby boom, and then another increase um, beginning in the early 1980s, over the millennials. Now, why that big increase in number of births in Vermont from 19, roughly 1980 until just August, roughly around 1994, so about 15 years. Well, do the math. Um, a woman who was born in 1955, in the middle of the baby boom, the average age of the first birth of a woman in the United States was about 25 years old. So 1955 plus 1970, uh, sorry, 1955 plus 25 takes you to 1980. And guess what? Those are the baby boomers having kids. Right? So that's what the millennials are. They don't like to think of themselves as just originally the millennial generation was called the baby boom echo generation. That didn't last very long. Right? For obvious reasons, the baby boomers wanted to think of themselves as you know being so important that they even influenced the, you know, have a name for the second generation. I guess the millennials didn't really like that. So that, that, you don't see that, that term anymore. But you do see that the fact that there's a lot of births in Vermont in that period because there's a lot of women in their prime childbearing years. Now, if you do the same exercise, you can take a woman who's born in 1980, 25 years later, it's 2006. You take the middle of this time period, 1990, let's say, and you add 25 years, and you get today. So notice, you don't get another echo, do you? So in Vermont, we're not seeing any kind of increase from um, those millennials having kids. And it's probably not <coughs> So um, when we think about the natural rate of increase, I said, well, I think that we're going to have a negative, that is, more deaths than births. Well, the deaths is due to these people getting older, right? But what about the births? Well, we don't see them. They're not happening. So we know these people are going to die. These people, the millennials, aren't having as many kids. And so that's why those lines are going to cross. The other interesting thing that you can see from this graph, but you can kind of have a mental image of this graph, say, well, is that happening nationally? And the answer is no. Here's a, a, graph, here's a graph of the number of births in the United States per year. So there's a the baby boom in the United States, same time period. But look at the millennials and compare that in Vermont. The millennial generation in Vermont, roughly the early 1980s to 1995, that's when we had those peak number of births, but it starts to decline. You don't see that in the U.S., right? It doesn't decline. The millennials in the U.S. are from the early 1980s, my two kids are in that group, um, through about the year 2000. So there's the year 2000 right, right here. And you can see that even though they're not millennials, there's still the same number of births in the generation that follows the millennials. That's not true in Vermont. So that's one big difference, um, that we have this continuing number of births in the United States that, that is roughly 4 million per year, but if I go back, the number of births in Vermont goes from 8,000 a year in the millennial period down to 6,000 today. That's a big decline. So again, Vermont is very different than the United States. And we are not behaving the same. If you look at the birth rate, or one way of measuring birth rate, Vermont births per thousand population, uh, you can see um, in the early 20th century about 20 births per thousand people. You can see the baby boom right here goes up to about 
about 23. In fact, in 1940, 1930, 1940, it was below 20. It's about 17 births per thousand people. Then the baby boom. We only really have two years here of the baby boom, but there's about a, a 30% increase in the number of births per thousand population, and then it just steadily goes down. So today uh, we have about 10 births per thousand people compared to 20 births or 25 births per thousand people in the baby. That, that's a big difference demographically. So, so you can see in terms of the births, um, we are not going to expect more Vermonters in the future because we're having more babies. Right? We're having fewer. So we're thinking about what causes population change, births and deaths. Well, deaths is rising, births are not increasing, in fact, they're probably falling. So we're not going to get any more people in Vermont from that. The second source of change in population for any entity, state, nation, um, is immigrants. And Vermont is not a place that immigrants come to. You can see that pretty much for the entire decade and a half since the 2000, uh, we've had 500 immigrants per year. It's risen a little bit in the last few years, up to 1,000. That's significant, uh, significant change. But it's still a very, very small number. That Vermont has, in percentage terms, uh, one of the smallest uh, shares of our population composed of people who were not born in the United States of any state. Nationally, about 13 or 14 percent of everybody living in the United States was not born here. That percentage is the highest it's been since 1900. Okay. Back in the 1970s, 1960s, uh, when many of us were growing up or as young, um, the, the percentage of, of foreign born in the United States was pretty much at its lowest level in, in maybe 100 or 200 years, 150 years. Um, it was down around 4 percent, which is where Vermont is. Vermont's about 3 or 4 percent. Moreover, the type of immigrants that come to Vermont, the type of, but the, the countries that immigrants come from into Vermont are very different than the United States. We all know the United States, most of the immigrants come from Latin America, right? Mexico, South America, and from Asia, China, Vietnam, and places like that, India for smaller extent. The thing about Vermont, and when we think about Vermont, and we think about immigrants, we always think about what? Refugees, right? We think about people from Somalia, Sudan, and African countries, um, uh, because they're so visible in Vermont. Because we don't have much of a minority population at all here. We're one of the smallest percentages in the country of Latinos or, or Black um, compared to other states. But here's a, an interesting trivia question that you'll bring home and tell all your friends. And, and the question is, of all the people in Vermont that were not born in the United States, what is the number one sending country? That is, where, uh, in terms of percentages, where uh, the highest percent of them were born in what country? Yes, Canada. Canada, and that's not true in the United States. We don't hear President Trump talking about building a wall across the northern border to keep them down the Canadian side, right? Um, yeah, but in Vermont, that, that is the most common. It's, it's, I mean, we've got people from all over the world, but the number one place is Canada. So it's a very small number. It doesn't give us a huge increase in population, certainly compared to the United States. One of the reasons the United States population is growing as fast as it is is because of immigrants, and immigrants tend to also have more, more babies um, than not. So if we're not getting any big increase in our population. Remember, there's 625,000 Vermonters. We're getting about 1,000 new ones um, from immigration, which is not much. The other one is what the monitors call net domestic immigration. And that domestic migration. And all this is, is the difference between the number of people moving into Vermont from other states and the number of people moving out of Vermont into other states. And we all know Vermont is the best place to live, and if we're not careful, we're going to end up looking like New Jersey, because so many people are going to move here, right? That's the very common statement you hear from people who are very concerned about building anything, houses, shopping centers, roads, whatever. Uh, and people always think that. 
people are going to be moving here in droves because of things that are going on. I remember after 9-11, uh, people saying, well, um, you know, people are going to be leaving New York City and major cities in droves because this kind of terrorist activity is going to continue. And with the internet, people can work from anywhere. And so therefore, we're going to get tons of people moving to Vermont from New York City to escape the problems they're going to have and take advantage of all the has to offer and including ease of work because of the internet. As you can see, that certainly has not happened. In fact, more people leave Vermont each year than move here. And that's been happening for the last decade. Before that, it was positive, not big, but it was positive. But now it's negative. More out migrants than people moving in. And the numbers accelerating, right? We're down to about 3,000 more people leaving each year than coming here. Uh, five years ago, it was about 1,000 to 1,500. Ten years ago, it was about even. So now I'm not going to predict that that line's going to keep going to keep going down. I don't know if it will or not. I do know that the birth and death one is going to keep going down. I, I'm pretty sure the immigrant one is not going to change much. This one, I don't think it's going to go up. It may continue to go down. It may be flat, but I don't think we're going to get people moving here on net. So I think we're going to continue seeing net out migration. There's a big discussion about who those people are, their income levels, their ages. People say that the we're losing young people. Well, that's partially true. I'll show you some graphs in a minute. But the real reason there's fewer young people today than there were in the past is because they weren't born. Right? Some of it's due to leaving, but remember those births. Remember? 25 years after those births, people are 25 years old. Um, and if they weren't born, they're not here. So you got to be really careful about, about interpreting some of these numbers and, and trends and, and what they mean. But we do see that, at least as far as the Census Bureau is able to estimate, um, their estimate is that more people leave than come. Okay, and that's been true, again, for the last well, for more than a year. We don't have the numbers from 2017 yet, and I'm not sure when the Census Bureau will, will have those, probably sometime early next year. So we put all those three together. Yeah, the natural rate of increase the L line. That's the number of births minus deaths. And you can see that it's kind of slowly coming down. We've got the immigrants, and that's roughly flat. So we have the natural increase of immigrants together. You got um, a little less than a thousand for both, with a little less than two thousand kind of adding to Vermont's population. But the net domestic migration is the big negative migrants. That's down to minus three thousand. So that's that explains what our population is doing. Essentially, the green line is countered pretty much exactly the sum of the red and the yellow. And so in the last 10 years, eight years, um, our population essentially hasn't changed because of that. So what about the age distribution of Vermont? Let's divide the state up into three groups. Let's we'll start with the young people, 20 and under. So since 2000, that is the last 15 to 16 years, we've had a decrease of about 25,000 young people, about 14%. If I drew this graph back from 1990, um, we'd see that that downward trend actually started before the year 2000. But there's a pretty sharp decline, a pretty steady decline in the number of young people, and that's a reflection of the fact that you know, the number of births are down since 20 years ago. Intervening 20 years, we're going to have a low population. So that, that's pretty much what you'd expect if birth rates are going down. And if young people aren't moving there, or families aren't moving there, at least young So but that's a pretty big decrease. What about the future? Well, um, projecting population in the future is very difficult. Um, the state of Vermont, about three or four years ago, did a preliminary forecast. Projection of the state's population. That's what that red bar is. Um, they actually did two. They did kind of a, a um, an optimistic scenario and a pessimistic scenario. And I looked at those numbers, and uh, their optimistic scenario is way optimistic, and their pessimistic scenario to me is realistic because it pretty much shows what has happened in the years since 
since they did that. So I'm pretty comfortable with that. But I'm all, also a little bit uncomfortable about any kind of projection. You've got to do some projection, but it's very difficult to do. Um, the, the state projects that Vermont's population, according to that pessimistic assumption, um, is going to be essentially the same in 2030 as it is today. Um, so that projection was done in 2013. Ten years earlier, in 2003, the Census Bureau itself did a projection of each state's population. And they projected that Vermont's population in 2030 would be um, about 75,000 more than it is today. Which is crazy. Uh, because we're already about, 20, about um, 25,000 short of their projection. So that's not going to happen. But this is kind of the most current and I think the best estimate. And you can see that over the next 15 years, 14 years, um, we're going to have a decrease of another 23,000. So we've lost, not we've lost, there's been a 25,000 decline, and there's going to be another 23,000 decline uh, over the intervening years. So the number of, of kids in Vermont um, is going to continue to decrease. Now, one of that has some, some financial and other implications. You would think that with a, a decrease of 25,000, percent decrease in the number of young people, and we've had roughly that percentage decrease in the number of kids in our schools in Vermont. It goes down by about 1% per year. We do that for 20 years, and we get a pretty significant decline, and that's what we've had. So you would think that if we had a decrease in the number of kids in our schools, uh, we wouldn't need to spend as much on education. And unfortunately, that, unfortunately me, uh, that has not happened. Um, so, over that 20 year period, since we had a, since the decline in school age children population has, has happened, we had the third, the second or third biggest decline in school age populations, the number of students in school, uh, of any state in the country. We've also had the sixth biggest increase in the total spending on education, not for people, just total spending. So as our student population was decreasing by a huge percent, roughly about 20 percent, our spending on education, total spending, was going way up. And what's really crucial, of course, is the spending per pupil. And if your spending is going up in, in the numerator of that fraction, and the number of students is going down in the denominator, your spending per pupil is going to go way up. And it has. So we've had, one, we've had the biggest increase in the nation in spending per pupil. The national average, according to the most recent data, which is 2014 and 15, um, the national average is uh, about $12,000 per student, and Vermont's about $18,000 per student. That was, that was three or four years ago. Um, so there's a huge. So, so we could save, the state could have saved some money, state and local governments could have saved some money by spending less on it, not less on education, but, but not having education costs grow as much because you're. you're fewer students to educate. But instead, we spent even more proportionally than almost any other state in the country. So over the next 15 years, as we continue to lose young people, or the number of lose, the number of young people keeps going down, um, what will happen to education spending? The last 15 years tells me that we're not going to save any money. We're going to continue to spend a lot, despite the efforts of uh, uh, some people to try to reduce spending. Act 46, if you're familiar with that, um, that, that the legislature passed, which I think uh, was going to pervade um, public relations um, and anything to really have to make sure to move back and spend. Anyway, so that's, that's the young part of the population. Then we can look at the other end of the spectrum, the, the old population. Um, some of you may be familiar with people in that age group. <laughs> um, I have become recently familiar with people. Um, so over the last 16 years, since the 2000 census, that's gone up tremendously. Right? 45, 44% increase. That's a huge increase in a relatively short time. Demographic numbers usually don't change by much. Um, it's it's kind of like the tide. It's slow. But this, by demographic standards, that's a huge change. And notice that most of that change has happened in the last eight or nine years, right? From 2000 to 2006 or seven, there really wasn't much change in the number of over 65-year-olds in Vermont. But since 2007, that, that 
curve has really been going on. What about the future? Okay, the, the blue bars are the same number. I've changed the scale. The scale here was down to zero. I've, I've changed the scale. So I, I changed it a little bit to make it look really organic, but it, it shows you more what's happening. So there's been an increase of about 44% since 2000 to 2016. And the percentage increase over the next 15 years or 14 years is going to be a little bit fast, like about 48 percent. So if we look at that, between 2000 and 2030, we're going to have about 90,000 more people in Vermont over 65, and the entire population isn't going to change at all. So simple math tells you if you have 90,000 more people over 65, you have 90,000 fewer people under 65. But that's a huge increase. I'll talk about some of the implications of that. That is dramatic. You know, Vermont is already one of the oldest states in the nation, the second oldest state in the nation by median age. Half of Vermonters are older than 42 point something, and half are younger. The only state that is older than Vermont is Maine. Florida. Florida's number three or number four. And that's because we tend to think of Florida of all the retirees that we must really pull up the average age, right? Well, it does, but you've got to remember there's also a lot of immigrants there. And the immigrants are younger, and they have kids, and that pulls the average down. Florida is still well the old, but not a little bit of Maine. And the other state that's up there in the top four is West Virginia, which I don't think Vermont wants to be compared to in any dimension. Right? Um, so those, those are the four oldest states in the nation, Maine, Vermont, West Virginia, and Florida. So we're going to have this huge increase in the number of senior citizens. Um, if you look at the, the share of the population over 65, you can see that in most of the recent past, 1980, 1990, 2000, even a little bit in 2010, Vermont looked just like the United States in terms of the percent over 65. We're starting to really have a gap now um, between Vermont and the U.S. And 2020, estimate is that we'll have a little over 20%, that is one in five Vermonters will be over 65, nationally 15%. And by 2030, more than a quarter of all Vermonters will be over 65, nationally it will be less than it is in Vermont today, essentially. So one quarter of all Vermonters over the age of 65, it's about 27%. Actually. So what does that mean? Well, one thing it means to me is there's going to be a lot of cars on the interstate with their turn signals on. <laughs> or maybe with the new electronics and cars that they'll be a voice that says, hey, you're on your turn signal on for 10 minutes? And there's something will shut it off. But, but that's, that's astounding. This is huge. In the middle, we've got working age for minors 25 to 64. Now, there are people younger than 25 working, there are people over the age of 64 working, but the prime working years are 25. You'll notice that my young people is under 20, and this is 25. So what about that 20 to 25 year old? Um, that's kind of screwed up by college students and leaving and coming. You know. So I kind of ignore, I, I probably should ignore the 18 to 25 year olds, but I, I ignore 20 to 25, 24 year olds, just to kind of make sure that the numbers aren't kind of skewed in here because of college students. But it wouldn't change these too much. But, so we look at the uh, prime working age for minors. You can see that um, up until about 2010, there was a, a small increase um, uh, in the number of people in that age cohort. But beginning just after the Great Recession, you know, 2009, 2010, it started decreasing. So we got some up and some down. The net is that um, 2016, there were fewer working age Vermonters than there were in 2000. And according to the state's forecast, Right, that the pessimistic slash realistic one, um, that number is going to continue to go down. So the net change is minus 4%, but of course, remember, we had an increase here. Um, so the net is just the difference between those two. So 4% change since 2000, a much bigger negative since 2010, but all my other numbers were from 2000, so I didn't want to cheat. But from now to 2030, Remember, it's only, we're talking about you know, only 13 years from now. It's not that far in the future. We're going to have another 10, 11 percent decline for 30,000. So you get those two together, and you get almost 50,000 
poor people of working age. And these aren't this not just these not workers, but people in their working age. So again, a huge decrease um, in this key element for any state. These are people who work. These are people who earn an income and pay taxes. Not that when you're retired, you don't earn an income. You don't, you don't earn as much. Uh, you don't pay as many taxes. So that's the really big story. So if we think about what that means for the future, so if you remember the first graph I showed you, Vermont's population stagnant for 100 years, right? And then a big increase over the next 40 year period from 1960 to 2000. And now, if we look at what's happening from 2010 to 2020, I showed you no change in population. The U.S. population growing at you know, maybe three quarters of 1%, 27, 28. 2020 to 2030, a slight decrease. We can call that zero for all practical purposes. The U.S. population is still growing about the same. You know, a slight slowdown to the U.S. But what does that look like? Well, it looks like, essentially, from 2000 to 2030, there's no change in population, which is exactly what Vermont experienced from 1820 to 1960. So, it's really a bad quote, because maybe the future is exactly what it used to be. Um, so Vermont's, Vermont's demographic future is not going to be like the experience that we've lived through over the last 50 years, since roughly 1960. Um, the experience of Vermont in the next, well, the next 20, 30 years, um, or at least 20, 30, but probably beyond, is going to be much like the experience of the 1800s and the first half of the 1900s. And things were very different. One of the reasons Vermont is what it is today is because of that experience. That's why we have so much open land and our towns look the way they do. Uh, it's because there was no growth, so nobody ever ripped anything down and built something new. Why bother? Um, it's very cheap now, and people come here to look at our little villages and things, but the reason they look the way they do is precisely because of this lack of demographic uh, change back in the 1800s and the 1900s. So, just to summarize it, so from 2010, 2030, so the 20-year period, essentially our population isn't going to change. Our total population is around 625,000. So the forecast is for a very slight increase of 5,000, we can call that zero. The over 65 population uh, over that 20-year period is going to increase by 90,000, essentially double. Uh, the over 75 population, I haven't talked about that, Old part of that demographic, but there's a big increase there of people uh, over 75 and over 85 as well. The young population is going to continue to fall, and the working age population decreases by about 50,000. So, um, <clears throat> that previous graph that I showed you about the, the forecast, you can look at and see kind of what's going on right now. and. Um, so if we look at over the last six years, what's happened at the county level, not a whole lot of good statistics about counties, the counties up in Vermont, but this is one that I like. Uh, if you look down at the bottom, and you can see there's, there's really only three counties in Vermont that have any significant population growth. Franklin, Chittenden, and Malone. These are, these are now in percentage terms. So now I'm, I am in Malone County, for some reason, is the fastest growing county in the state. And I haven't really been able to figure out what's driving that population growth. Um, Chittenden is right behind it, <coughs> and Franklin is right behind that. <coughs> but once you get, just like I said before, with the numbers, once you get beyond those, those counties, um, everything's negative. And the more important thing about this is to look at the bottom bar. The bottom bar is in the United States. So the United States population over the last six years has been growing per year at about 0.8%. Even Memorial County, the fastest growing county in Vermont in terms of population, is growing more slowly than the U.S. average. So basically, there's no part of Vermont that has population growth as fast as the national average. So we are really different than the U.S. Usually, when you do a graph like this, you'll find some, some counties that are going faster than the U.S. and some that are going 
slower. But here's a state where every county is going slower. That's very unusual. So, what does this mean? I'll, just, I'll wrap up uh, with this. What kind of does it mean for the economy? So, the main thing is a shrinking working age population. So, if you're an employer, you've got people retiring. Where do you get new workers? If you're an entrepreneur and you're starting a new business, where do you get your workers? If you're an existing business and you're expanding, where do you get your workers? Well, one thing you could argue is, well, you get it from some other business. But that just pushes the problem onto that other business, doesn't it? Where are they going to get their work? The simple economic answer that any, anybody that's had basic economics course would say, well, prices solve all problems, and they do solve lots of problems. So all you have to do is pay workers more, and you will get people moving in to take those jobs, right? If you can't find someone to work for $20 an hour, $85,000 a year, whatever kind of job you're talking about, you raise the wage and somebody from out of state will say, hey, I can make more money than I am now by coming to Vermont. But there's a few problems with that. One problem is, is that you can't just pay that new worker the higher wage. You've got a whole bunch of people making $15 an hour, and you need one more person and you offer $18 an hour, you're going to have to pay all the other workers $18 an hour, right? They're all going to have some serious morale problems in your business. That means your costs are going to go up. And then we have to think about what kind of business are you talking about? Are you talking about a restaurant in St. Albans? Well, the owner might be able to you know, get more workers by paying higher wages to everybody. And that means their costs are higher, so they're just going to have to charge more. So when you go out for dinner, you're going to pay more. You can always choose not to go out for dinner as much, but but that's the, that's the end result. But what if you're a business that sells products on the national or the international market? What if you're a small shop, or a or a manufacturer, or many jurors, right? You're selling your products to people from out of state. Either they're coming here to enjoy the product, like Stowe and Mountain Resort, or many jurors are selling their ice cream. Um, well, you're gonna have to raise your prices. Ben and jurors are gonna be less competitive, Stowe Mountain Resort is going to have to charge higher lift ticket prices, and therefore people are going to say, well, if you take a vacation to Snow, it's going to be a lot more expensive. It's going to be more expensive. More expensive than what? More expensive than the alternatives. So you ask yourself, well, what are the alternatives? Do people, do people have to ski at Snow? The answer is no. They could ski somewhere else where it's cheaper. In Maine or New Hampshire, well, they have the same problem. They go to Colorado and ski. Or, you know, when you do a winter vacation, there are a number of choices you can have for a winter vacation. You don't have to skate. You can go to Disney or take a Caribbean cruise or go to Europe. There's lots of things you can do in the winter. So, but the point is that you can't just say, well, just pay higher wages and we'll get more people and that'll solve that problem of 50,000 fewer people in that work, potential workforce because that has implications for those businesses. Have a hard time competing. So the second part is the changing mix. What do I mean there? Well, if there's going to be 80,000 more people over 65 and 50,000 fewer people um, in their prime working years, and fewer people under 20 and fewer people in their early 20s, we think about where those people spend their money. When you're 30 years old, you go out to a bar. Most of you don't go out to a bar. So we're going to have a change in the mix of the type of businesses. I was, I was giving a talk similar to this to the um, Post and Church Street Marketplace. And they were talking about how they're going to, they said, well, we need to figure out how we're going to attract more young people. I said, you need to figure out how you're going to attract more old people to Church Street. That's the future. You know, that's the big demographic. You can shit in town. Yeah, you got to yeah, we can attract more people. So how are you going to get people in their 60s to come down to Church Street? Shop and to eat out. That's really, that should be what you're thinking about, not how you get more money. So, so it's really a whole change of what, what do people over 65 spend their money on? We know one thing they spend their money on is health care. We all know that. Have, let's, let's pursue that. So, what does that mean? Well, um, 
And essentially, we're going to roughly double the number of people over 65. What do you think that means in terms of hospital care? Well, probably roughly twice as much, you know, not, not exactly, but you know, if you go to the Northwest Medical Center or any, any hospital, you're going to you know, a lot of the patients are over 65. Um, so if there's a lot more people in that age group, there's going to be a lot more people that are getting sick and need to go to the hospital. There's going to be a lot more people that need assisted living centers uh, for a variety of reasons. Well, that means you need more doctors and more nurses and more assisted living centers themselves, and more people working in those assisted living centers. Where are you going to get all those people? We're back to question one, right? Those are, the, those are partially economy that are going to be expanding and are going to need more people. Well, maybe you can take people in the bars that are going out of business because people aren't drinking as much and put it in the assisted living center. I'm not sure I want to have one of those people operating on me, but you know, maybe they sweep the floor, um, serve food. But again, it's different skill sets, right? So there's a lot of changes going on. Where are we going to get all the, where are we going to get the doctors and nurses, the, the real professionals that we need in those places? There's a big increase in the need and demand for those kinds of, of services. Um, Actually, I'll go back. Yeah. So, what about housing? Um, well, a lot of people over 65 just stay where they are. But a lot of them have downsides, right? You don't need as big house. Your kids are long gone. Why do you need those three extra bedrooms? Yeah, it's nice to have room for the kids and the grandkids to come back. But you really want to maintain a house that big. Um, plus, you know, your mortgage is paid off, hopefully. And uh, you'd like to unlock some of that equity and use it to live on in your retirement. You know, the, the biggest asset that most Americans have is not 401ks or Roth IRAs, it's their house. And so you would like to use some of the equity that you've built up over the years, sell the house, sell your house for $200,000, buy a $150,000 condo somewhere, apartment, live in an apartment, and use that extra money in your retirement for whatever you want. The problem is that everybody over 65, or lots of people over 65, are thinking that same way. Who's going to be buying the houses? Remember, what's true about the number of people between 25 and 64, or between, I haven't done the numbers here, but between you know, prime home buying uh, ages, 25 to 35 or 40, what happens? That number of people in the, that demographic is shrinking. So, where's the buyers for your house? Now, I'm an economist. I know that you can always sell your house. You know, your, your two hundred thousand dollar house that you think is worth two hundred thousand. I'll buy it for fifty. <laughs> the point is, you may not be able to get what you think your house is worth. Somebody will buy it for a low price, but lower than you think, which means you're not going to use riches for fun. You are expecting to have a certain amount of money available for you in your retirement by selling your house and downsizing. No, maybe not. So, in fact, if you look at the average price of a house in Vermont, it hasn't changed in about six or seven years. Not statewide, but, but it's flat. There's, no, there's been no housing price appreciation in Vermont, on average. And obviously, it's, it's not the same in every county and every town, but on average, there's no price appreciation. So, that, that's, that's a problem. You know, a lot of upset people when you tell them that, you know, that house that you thought was worth X dollars is worth 80% of X. It's not a very pleasant thing. X is a big number. What about the state budget? Well, if we have fewer working age people, we're probably going to have fewer workers. The number of employees in Vermont is going to fall. We haven't seen that yet, but over the last three or four years, the employment in Vermont has been flat. It hasn't grown. So at best, it's going to be flat. Maybe it's going to fall, which means there's going to be less, it's not that tax revenues are going to fall, but it's not going to grow as fast as it has in the past, or as politicians expect. And you can see that already. The last five years in Vermont, they started out with a budget shortfall. Right? Revenues have not grown as fast as they expected. The projections for revenues are always lower than were in the past, um, and that's in part a reflection of this. Not only that, but the expenditure are going to change. There's going to be a lot more people over the age of 65. They get different types of services from the state than people who are younger. So the whole state budget is going to be affected. Um, one thing, state pensions. 
um, as more and more state employees retire. The pension, model, the pension cost, the state was not, not like a private firm where they built up a, a, a fund for pensions. Uh, Vermont has underfunded its pension liabilities, a pension fund, as well as its health care fund for retirees to the tune of, well, they should be spending about 50 to 100 million dollars more a year than they are. But at some point, those, those um, liabilities become due. So that's a serious problem. What about health care costs? Is the state going to be on the hook for a higher health care cost? Well, in part, yes, because of state employees, as they retire and they get older, they're going to be using more health care. But there's a more fundamental problem, and that is we think about the population as a whole. So uh, a quick refresher, um, we all know what Medicare is because we're all on it, right? We all apply for it. Uh, so Medicare is the, is the health care for people over 65, and it's funded by who? Yeah, the federal government federal government's taxpayers. But yeah, the federal government is responsible for Medicare, not the state. Medicaid is the health care program for low income. That is funded jointly by federal and state funds. It's roughly a 50-50 match. Okay. But the state doesn't. So what is the people getting older? Because once you're 65 and you're poor and you're sick, Medicare pays, right? So what's the big deal for Medicaid? Well, the issue is what for people in the, in the industry that are in this, the part of this are called dual eligible people or duallys. And what duallys are are people who are over the age of 65 and are poor and need assisted living. Who pays for that? Not Medicare. Medicaid pays, which means the state is on the hook for paying its share of the cost of putting older, low-income people into these types of facilities. And we all know what the cost of these facilities are. Very expensive. Out of the state's Medicaid budget, about 20% of the population are these dual eligible people right now. These dual people over the age of 65 who are who need assisted living. They account for something like 80% of the Medicaid budget. So, in simple math, the number of people in Vermont over 65 doubles. What happens to the cost to the state of these people? And the answer is going to double. You know, and it's already a big chunk of money. It's not like it's a small pot of money. It's, it's already very expensive. And it's going to get even more expensive. So, the state's going to have to find revenue sources to pay for that, either new taxes or to have to cut something else. Transportation issues. I already talked about that turn signal problem. Um, but you know, the thing about transportation, um, get over your eyesight gets worse. Um, a lot of Vermonters live in the country. We all know that Vermont roads are not the best in the world. Um, you know, how do you deal with that? The, the senior citizen buses that we have and the shuttle services, they're going to have to be expanded. Um, so there's, there's transportation issues as well. I, I have my own pet um, proposal. Um, for, for what they do about that, and, and it's, it's a cheap one. And um, one thing that always aggravates me about driving in Vermont at night is that there's no lines on most of the roads, or you know, they paint them every 10 years or so. So essentially, there are none. So it's not real expensive to paint them more frequently. And you know, having a yellow line in the middle and a white dot on the side, you can find out where the road is. Not as many accidents, especially for people whose vision is going. So that's a lot cheaper than doing a lot of other things, right? I mean, a bunch of paint, a bunch of people with paint cars. Um, my simple proposal for alleviating a very small part of the transportation problem. But, you know, uh, but there's all sorts of issues like that. You know, what do you do with people who can't drive or have more limited driving access, especially as they're, they're getting older and there's so many more. And finally, the last one that, that I think is important is going to um, We all know who doesn't vote in States in terms of age, right? it's young people. They, they don't vote anymore, most of them. A lot of them voted for Barack Obama um, in 2008. Um, but young people don't vote. We all know who does vote in Vermont. Old people. They, they vote in much higher percentages than young people. So if we think about the voting age population in Vermont, not the total population, the total population is everything. The voting age population, people between the ages of 18 and Right now, people over the age of 60, and I'm using 60 now because I think people 
people over 60 start seeing their retirement as, as not something that's hypothetical in the future, but something that's pretty close to it. Um, so right now, if you think about people in Vermont over the age of 60, they are about a little over 25% of all the voting population. Not necessarily the voters, but the voting population, because we don't know, you know who votes in Vermont by age. We just know the demographics. But, but one out of four Vermonters um, of voting age are, are over 60 years old. In 2030, it's going to be 43%. Then in close to half of all the voters are over 65. So when we think about the politics of that, um, what are they going to ask? You know, we got almost half of the voters, potential voters, they got people running for office. What do you think these people are going to ask their politicians or the candidates to do? And the answer is either give them some benefits, give them some tax relief, or don't take away some benefits. Do you, you want to cut the funding for the, the senior bus? Absolutely not. In fact, we want you to double the funding for it. So there's a tremendous pressure to either add more services or not to cut services for people over the age of 60 or 65. At the same time, remember, the net revenues coming to the state is not going to be growing as fast because there's going to not going to be a, a proportional increase in state revenues because there's no more workers. Um, and so we're going to have this political, not problem, but this political dynamic that's going to play out where the older voters are going to really dominate um, the voting and therefore the discussion of what's going to happen in the month. So um, my conclusion is that, these are the mind conclusion, uh, the darn top of the cap into the socks of the machine goes. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Number two is they just like to work, right? 
works, works uh, fun for some people. It's interesting, enjoyable. There's a social context. Um, so those are those are some reasons. Um, and number three is that our life expectancy is increasing. And what's this magical thing about age 65? Life expectancy at 65 back in 1950. I think it was about eight years. That is, the average 65 year old person could expect to live to 73. Now, the average 65 person, year old person can expect to live to about 85. Okay. So, there's been a big increase. So, um, you know, people just might want to work. You know, we're, 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 we're all healthier than we used to be 50 years ago, 40 years ago. Um, work is not as hard as it used to be. 40 or 50 years ago, where a lot of labor was physical. Some people still do physical labor through the construction trades and things. But most, for most people, that's not true. Most, most, um, most jobs do not involve really hard physical labor. Um, so there's a, there's a number of reasons why we might think that one of the, one of the kind of things I don't look at in here that could solve that problem of where the, where the employees come from, at least, is that over 65 population could be a sort of a solution. Um, now, could the state do something to try to accelerate that? Well, they could. You know, they could do something with taxes if they wanted to. You know, cut tax rates for older people who work. I'm not saying I have a bad thing that. I have to look at it. But there are different policies you can do to try to, you know, if you're trying to figure out what can the state do to get more workers, then one answer is to encourage people over 65 not to retire and to work. And employers can do that too, just by offering different benefits or having a schedule. Say, you know, you want to take off two months and go travel? Go ahead, you do it. We'll have your job waiting for you when you get back. But it's pretty hard for someone who's 40 years old to do that. I've kind of seen that in the agricultural field, in the dairy farm, where farmers uh, often hire older people that have already owned a farm and sold the farm, mm -hmm. but they're still working. No. Yeah. If there's fewer, then we know that 
very few people in that age group die, so it's, it's all moving, right? So if there's fewer, then you say, well, they must have moved, or their families have moved, but you, know, you get the idea. So you can kind of ferret that out and say, okay, if there's fewer 35-year-olds than there were 15-year-olds 20 years earlier, they move. You can do that with like 17-year-olds, it gets a little better in the college. And so what we found when we did that was that, yes, indeed, we did find evidence that there was out-migration of young people, that there were fewer people in those age groups than you would expect based on a census of 10 years earlier. Now, some of that may be families moving, some of it may be the people themselves who graduated from high school or college just never going to leave or they don't come back. But there is some evidence using that that there is out-migration from Vermont. Again, just like there was in the 1800s and the early 1900s. You know, why did they leave? You know, farming was better in Ohio, but also there were more opportunities elsewhere. And there's a lot more opportunities elsewhere today than there are in Vermont. <coughs> yep. Art, is the governor still talking about somehow increasing the state's population by whatever, 50,000, 100,000, or have you and others convinced him? It's just not going to happen. I don't really convince him. I talked to the governor once, he came to my class, and we hadn't spoken. He didn't talk about that part of um, I haven't heard him talk about that. I mean, he, he mentioned it, I think, early in his term, getting 70,000 more Vermonters, and I have no idea where he came up with that number or, or how he was going to do it. Um, so, yeah, um, I haven't heard that discussion. I, I, think, um, I think that the governor knows there's a demographic problem, but Governor Douglas and Governor Shumlin also knew it, too, and tried to do things that you can see from my numbers. Um, it's really hard to move those, those trends. Um, so it's, it's very difficult. And a lot of it just has to do with the fundamentals of Vermont that you, you can't change. You know, some, of, some of the things are not you can't change. You can't change the weather, right? You can't change the fact that people today want to live in major urban areas. People want to live, not necessarily in midtown and Hamlet, but people want to live near a big city, especially younger people. That's where there's a lot of economic opportunity. That's where there's a lot of other young people. That's where there's um, exciting things to do. And Vermont doesn't have any big cities. You know, Burlington is really a joke by national standards. Nobody would think of Elmira, New York as a big city. So why is Burlington Vermont? They're both the same size. Okay. Um, now, the thing is, there's nothing we can do about that. And by the way, that's all based on people's preferences, right? So back in the 1960s and 70s, people liked living in rural areas, right? It was just, people enjoyed that kind of lifestyle. There was something about it that allowed Vermont to, you saw that graph. Why did our population increase so much back in the 60s, 70s, and the 80s, and the 90s? And the answer is, rural lifestyles and small town lifestyles appealed to people a lot more than they do today. It wasn't because all they did was move to Vermont. That, that's not why that graph looked like. No, well, that, that is something you can do. <clears throat> so, so there's nothing we can do about that, right? About people's preferences for urban versus rural lifestyles. We can do things about, about things like taxation. I don't know how important that is, but there are things, you know, we can do things, something about certain things that may cause people not to come here or to leave. There's, there's nothing we can do about some factors like the city, city issue. And you can try to make your cities bigger by making more attractive people. That's what you have to do. Yeah? yeah. Packing is a presentation. Why is our pool still living in Vermont? Good question. Why am I still living here? Um, number one is I enjoy it. I like it. I will say that I, I have friends who were recently retired from UVM who have left because of the tax issues. Um, but I enjoy it, and I have a, what I think is a very unique lifestyle. There's very few places that I can live where I can be out in the country on 140 acres um, with a middle-class lifestyle. You know, if I was living in New York City or Boston and I'm on 140 acres, I'd either have to be a multimillionaire or I'd have a three-hour commute. So there are certain aspects of my lifestyle that I like. I don't like paying my property tax. And I in the taxes I can sort of deal with, because I know I can get it anywhere. Uh, so there are some negatives, but you know, to me, life is kind of a balance sheet. You got assets and liabilities. And the trick is, in terms of the state, 
is you want to make sure you're not adding your liabilities and you want to maximize your assets. And part of it's personal. You know, when I talk to my friends and they like, find out where I live and you know, my lifestyle, they're somewhat envious. Um, on the other hand, they have things where they live that I'm envious of as well. But that, that's why I'm here. I, I came here because I wanted to be here and I got my next job off a long time ago, but I stayed for five years. You know, I, I probably will stay. That's a good question. <laughs> yeah. Well, I say just a comment, but it seems to me that a lot of the answers are going to be found at the ballot box. Don't the answers can be found at the ballot box? Well, I don't know. You know, um, the, one of the problems, I think, is that that's just one element of our problem. So let me kind of talk globally for, for a minute. Um, this problem that I've outlined, um, I could probably do graphs that look identical to almost any rural part of any state. And by rural, I, I mean large. So, so for example, New York, which we tend to think of as New York City, but it's also absurd in Albany. If you take New York State north of Westchester County, so north metropolitan New York, you'd probably get some graphs that look very similar to this. And you'd certainly get a graph that look very similar to this if you look at the rural parts of New York that is outside of those three major cities. You know, not just the Adirondacks, but the Finger Lakes and, and the Southern Tier. And if you did Pennsylvania, outside of Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, you'd get the same problem. And if you did Kansas, outside of Kansas City, you'd get the same problem, and a few other cities. You get the same problem. This is, this is a problem that's endemic to rural America. The problem was Vermont was entirely rural by anybody's real definition of rural, right? In terms of it. When, it, when you think a city has less than 40,000 people, that's rural. <clears throat> so this is a problem everywhere. It's not just Vermont. <clears throat> so to that extent, you know, if we cut our taxes in half somehow, our property taxes in half, and our income taxes in half, would it affect these graphs? And the answer is maybe a little bit, but I don't think that it would affect it that much. Maybe we just would want to affect it a little bit, but, but I think there's some more fundamental problems, and that fundamental problem is people do not want to live in rural areas anymore. And again, by rural, I, I'm including Chicken County as rural, it's certainly frankly. <coughs> Even though we think of St. Albans as being a city, and, you know, but again, by, by most of our, people want to live in metropolitan areas where there's at least a half a million people you know, within that. <coughs> Yeah. I'm just wondering if you, uh, if you have any ideas about the impact of uh, technology on demographics. In fact, the technology on demographics. Well, you know, when the internet started, I remember going to conferences where everybody was convinced that this was going to be the salvation of Vermont's economy. Because with this thing called the internet, you could work, you could work anywhere you wanted to, including Vermont. All of a sudden, Vermont's detriments of not being near a big city were vanished. Um, yeah. Again, <laughs> it has to happen. So I, I don't really think so. And not only that, but if you think technology kind of means the end of distance, like distance doesn't matter anymore, so you can anywhere. Um, well, there's, I think, about 4 million acres, or 4 million square miles in the United States. People could live in any rural part of the United States they wanted to. We don't, we don't have anything that other rural areas don't have. I mean, it's nicer here in the middle of Kansas. But, you know, Wyoming, Montana, Utah, rural areas, they're pretty nice too. So then you're, if, you, if you think that that matters, then you've got to convince me that living in rural Vermont is much better than living in rural, you know, fill in the blank for the state, because there's a lot of gorgeous areas in the United States that are, um, you know, would be accessible. So you've got to tell me what our advantage is. Mark, you had their attention. <laughs> Thank you.